Hello and behind me is a Lockheed Martin F-22 Raptor, which is a fifth generation tactical fighter jet that uses stealth technology and is still in active military service. There's only one on display in the world and it's right behind me and in this video I'm going to take you on a detailed tour of it. I make videos about planes. This includes trip reports, onboard flights from around the world and tours through interesting aircraft in museums. I'm also on Instagram and Facebook. And a huge thanks to the National Museum of the USAF in Dayton, Ohio for letting me film this aircraft. Study at the nose, you'll see that this is a further evolution of the Chine design that we saw on the SR-71 with the blended facet boundaries. These are the horizontal lines leading aft from the nose and they act to improve directional stability with increased angles of attack. Blending them into the wing also avoids presenting corner reflections or vertical sides to radar waves, thus reducing the radar cross-section. Behind the ray dome is the APG-77 multi-mode radar. You may recall that the F-117 didn't have a radar because the radar waves themselves could be detected by the enemies. So to get around this, the radio frequencies are changed 1000 times per second to reduce the chances of interception. There's also an electronic attack capability where it can release huge amounts of energy directed at the enemy sensor to help overload it. This here is the pitot tube which measures the airspeed. These panels here are to access parts of the equipment underneath. Just in front of the cockpit is the missile launch detector, which remains highly classified. Now the air that runs along the side of the fuselage, which is called the boundary layer, is always turbulent and you don't want it entering the engine intake, therefore there is this space to catch it. This air is also used for the radiators for the liquid cooled electronic systems, and then it exits via a vent on top of the aircraft, which I'll show you shortly. You've also got these air holes here which are designed to capture and remove any additional boundary layer of air that may have formed. They work by applying a small amount of suction that draws the air inwards and then out through a vent away from the engine intake. Now the engine inlet is covered but you wouldn't be able to see much as the intake duct bends slightly as to avoid exposing the engine face and turbines to the exterior as they would also light up on an enemy radar. The boundary air comes out this vent, the intake bleed air comes out this one, and this is the outlet for the air used for the cooling equipment I just mentioned before. The weapons are all stored in three internal weapons bays, which has the benefit of improved aerodynamics as well as reduced radar cross section over simply attaching them underneath. Here the port side bay is open and underneath is the larger ventral bay. You'll notice the use of serrated edges on these panels and these help deflect radar waves from the panel boundaries. Also the large and flat underside generates some of the lift unlike some of the other fighters that have the rounded undersides. On display here is an inert AIM-9 side winder air-to-air -air missile. Even though this missile first entered production in 1956, it remains in service and is the most widely used air-to-air -air missile in the West with over 110,000 built. AIM-120 AMRAN missiles can also be fitted and JDAM and JBU-38 guided bombs as well. There are also four underwing mounting points which can carry 600 gallon drop tanks as you can see with this one or more weapons. There's also a cannon on the opposite side which I'll mention later. This here is the outlet for the turbine power module and used to start the engines. Here's the landing gear which is in a standard tricycle layout. As to help with the maintenance process and also to remove the need for other hatches that will potentially risk more panel gaps that could return radar signals, they place the major routine maintenance items such as hydraulic filters and reservoirs all inside the landing gear wheel wells. Now the wing is a clipped diamond like a delta wing providing a compromise between low and supersonic speed. While the top speed is Mach 2.2, the problem is that aerodynamic heating will make the wing's leading edge light up on an infrared detector, thus reducing its stealthiness. This here is the leading edge flap that increases the lift at low speed. The F-22 uses the ALR-94 electronic warfare system that includes over 30 antennas which, unlike older fighters, which look like pimples and bulges on the aircraft skin, these are all integrated into the wings and fuselage, thus reducing aerodynamic drag and increasing stealthiness. These can detect threats from over 250 nautical miles away. In fact, here's some antennas here, and yes, you can't actually really see them. Now if you look at this section here, and this is old footage I took at an air show, you'll see two open ports. The forward one is the intake for the auxiliary power generation system, which is the APU, and behind that is the exhaust for it. And having just mentioned the lack of sensors and pimples, this here is a navigation light which they couldn't hide for obvious reasons. Looking underneath the wing, these two bulges are flight control actuators. And moving back, we'll see the all-moving tailplane or the stabilator. 
Now unlike a standard horizontal stabiliser which might be fixed with the elevator on the trailing edge moving for pitch control as the name suggests, this whole control surface moves. It allows for more dramatic changes in pitch which might be important during a dogfight and provides for better supersonic pitch control where the traditional and small elevator would be less effective. Then we can see the canted vertical stabilisers which is interesting for a few reasons. Now they're angled slightly downwards as they discovered that this reduced the radar cross section as they deflect radar waves downwards rather than straight back at the radar receiver like a standard 90 degree vertical tail would. And the reason that there's two tails is that it creates a larger surface area for the control surface without otherwise having a massive single tail. This results in redundancy if one is damaged, then the other one can be used for directional control. It also means that when flying with a higher angle of attack, so when the nose is right up in the air and the fuselage would usually block some of the airflow moving backwards, there is more control surface there to catch the minimal airflow that there might be. Now through the power of editing trickery, I've removed the engine covers and now you're looking right at the outlet of a Pratt & Whitney F119 PW100 augmented turbofan. Unlike most jet engines, the fuel for the afterburner is only sprayed in from below instead of the usual top and bottom to ease maintenance. What's interesting is that the engine outlet is actually a long way inside and this is to reduce the F22's heat signature, which is all a part of the stealthiness. Bypass air from the turbofan is blown through these little holes cooling the surface of the duct as well as the thrust itself. You've got these tiles here that all work to cool the exhaust so that by the time it physically leaves the duct it's cooler and therefore less likely to gain enemy attention. You can see in here the mechanism for the pitch axis thrust vectoring nozzles which can pivot the thrust plus or minus 20 degrees increasing its maneuverability. When traveling at lower speeds, there is less air moving over the control surfaces that would normally decrease its maneuverability. But by being able to essentially angle the thrust in different directions, the exhaust becomes a secondary control surface. It produces 35,000 pounds of thrust with the afterburner, although it's also capable of super cruise, which is cruising at supersonic speed without the afterburner. Therefore, it doesn't require as much fuel for supersonic flight as all other fighters would. Again, here's another view of the two-dimensional thrust vectoring nozzles that you can see would squeeze the thrust, directing it up and down and port and starboard. You can also see the cooling holes again, which were important as the nozzles would be moving directly into the line of fire and exposed to incredible temperatures. Many other aircraft have rounded nozzles, but they would have a much higher radar cross-section, hence why these are square. Of interest, the Russian and Chinese fifth generation fighters have circular exhaust nozzles, therefore we already know that their stealthiness has been compromised. Now this under here is the stealthy housing for the emergency arrestor hook, and I should clarify that this was not designed for carrier landings. There were initial plans for a carrier version, but they didn't eventuate. As we make our way forward to check out the cockpit and the top of the F-22, I'll mention that it can become like a mini AWACS aircraft in that it can link between other friendly aircraft, designated targets, and coordinate attacks. It can also pass data between each other, such as the weapons that have been released from other friendly aircraft. By the way, here's the starboard stabilator, which is really quite large and would also create further lift. Something that is really interesting is that there are no speed brakes, but a similar mechanism. The flight control computers can simultaneously move both rudders outwards in opposite directions, the aileron and flaperons all moving opposite each other and essentially acting together like speed brakes. It's incredibly complex and adds to the unique maneuverability of the F-22. While this is officially called a Lockheed, it's actually a team effort. Lockheed did the airframe and assemble it, but Boeing did the wings, the aft fuselage and avionics and Pratt & Whitney obviously did the engines as I said earlier. Around one third of the F-22 is titanium, a quarter is composites, and other smaller percentages are aluminium and steel. There are small amounts of RAM, which is radar absorbing material used in the F-22, but nothing like on the F-117 that was covered in it. The shape and other technology all work together to reduce the radar cross-section and importantly help it avoid the extremely complex maintenance requirements of the likes of the F-117 and B-2, the latter of which needed to be stored in a climate controlled hangar. Here's me looking very excited and behind my head is the retractable door and under that is the M61A2 Vulcan rotary cannon. And here's a better view. This has been used in many other fighters, although the F-22's version has thinner barrels to reduce the weight. And while we're on the top, this here is the in-air refueling receptacle. These are the intake overpressure spill doors that can also be used to allow in additional air if the engine requires it. 
This here is the GPS antenna and behind that is the exhaust for the onboard inert gas generating systems and onboard oxygen regenerating systems. These bleed engine air and do exactly what their name suggests. The inert air is used for fuel tank fire suppression and the G-suit inflation and the oxygen is obviously for the pilots. Now let's climb up into the cockpit. While this actual aircraft did fly during the F-22's development, most of the equipment was removed and used in other aircraft. This was the first fighter with an all glass cockpit, which means that it's all screens inside rather than dials. Now there's multiple screens including the heads up display, which can be configured however the pilot wants, and they'll display all of the usual parameters. It's also compatible with night vision goggles. The throttle would have been here on the left and the control stick is mounted here on the right. And these little handles here would fire off the ejection seat, which is an ACES-2, commonly used in USAF aircraft. Between 2005 and 2011, 195 F-22s were built and it remains in active service, therefore many aspects of it are still classified. The canopy was the first frameless design used in a fighter and this helps reduce radar cross-section. I hope you enjoyed the video. Please check out my channel for many other similar tours and subscribe as I've got many more coming including the YF-23. Thanks for watching.